First and foremost, thank you uh, to the Vermont Humanities Council, to the Norwich Public Library, and to the Norwich Historical Society for inviting us to speak about Burlington's immigrant Jewish community and our ongoing Lost Mural Project. Perhaps an appropriate way to introduce these two topics is with a couple of quotes. The first from Ru uh, Philip Rubin, a former Burlington resident writing in a New York Jewish magazine in 1949, observed, quote, we were a Lithuanian Jewish village that happened to be stranded in Vermont, which was only superficially affected by American ways that basically lived and maintained for a full generation its Eastern European Jewish pattern of life. Now to, this, to the lost mural, uh, a favorite quote of ours comes from P Dr. Peter Manso, who's the curator of the American Religious History Collection at the Smithsonian Institute. Peter observed, quote, the lost mural is a symbol that crosses generations and validates the universal story of communities built by refugees and immigrants in those communities. The ability of future generations to learn from the important piece of, his of American history depends on actions taken today. The need to further preserve and restore the mural is urgent. It is essential to safeguarding its legacy. Burlington's Jewish community dates to the late 1800s when a group of recent Lithuanian immigrants joined together to form the Ohavi Zedek, or Lovers of Justice, congregation in 1885. All were peddlers in the, re in the area. Nathan Lamport had achieved greater success in the form of a peddler's supply shop within walking distance of Burlington's bustling waterfront, then America's second largest lumber port. This afforded him ready access to traders along the lake. In practicality though, the story really begins earlier in Lithuania, a small country in Eastern Europe. Even more precisely, the story originates in a small rural village outside of Kovna, Lithuania. With few exceptions, the first hundred or so settlers in the 1880s were almost entirely interrelated residents from a single small shtetl or village named, named Shekeska, or in Yiddish, Shaikashak. Nathan Lamport's three brothers and his sister quickly joined him in settling in Burlington. More impressive was the arrival of Lamport's nephew, Max Rosenberg, who subsequently returned with his grandparents, his father, five uncles and their families, an extended family totaling 42 members. The geographic character of Czechishka resembled Burlington. Both share a similar climate based on latitude and longitude and both are situated on water and surrounded by large rural spaces. I had an opportunity to revisit my ancestral home in Lithuania in 2007 and discovered that the village of Czechishka still retains a lovely pastoral character. The farmland and animals are similar to the valley and tranquil river, Winooski River, abutting Burlington's old north end. Even today, the village of Czechishka still retains its old world appearance, consisting of homes and businesses that in shtetl times offered a variety of vital services, including butchers, bakers, and a dairy catering to the needs of an Orthodox Jewish population. One of the themes tonight is the importance of saving artistic heritage for all peoples. Uh, synagogues were built in the 17th century in Lithuania of stone and masonry, and hundreds more were built of wood in less affluent communities in the 18th century. The synagogue in Czechishka was located in the town center opposite a church and within walking distance of the homes to facilitate regular attendance at daily prayer services. During my visit to Lithuania, I gained entry into the Czechishka synagogue where I discovered an empty structure with the exception of a single painted plaster ark. The artwork around the Torah ark depicts symbols of the 12 tribes of Israel. Though I didn't realize it at the time, we have since learned that this ark was one of the last remaining painted arks in Lithuania 
According to Dr. Samuel Gruber of Syracuse University, an internationally acclaimed expert in worldwide Jewish art and monuments. Sam's, Sam's expertise, as well as his support for the Lost Mural Project, can be seen on his blog at samuelgruber.com. This is another detailed picture of the columns to the right of the Czechishka Ark. We now realize that the uh, Czechishak immigrants who settled in Burlington's still rural North End in the 1880s were inspired by its remarkable semblance to their former home. The synagogue they built too looked very much like the one they had left behind. And in the spirit of the shtetl, all of the inhabitants lived within two blocks of that synagogue. Our studies tracking immigrant movements within Burlington has documented that residents of the Jewish community moved closer to the synagogue as their wealth increased, an expression of piety and status. While the lost mural was painted in 1910, its story really begins in 1889 with a schism that erupted within the fledgling community of perhaps 150 Jewish residents. And the construction of a second synagogue, Chayotam, translated as the life of man. Built only four years after and situated within a hundred yards of the original Havizetic synagogue, Chayotam resembled a classic Eastern European wooden synagogue with one notable exception. It incorporated a Victorian East facing extended apse, which according to Sam Gruber appears to be a unique feature. The ceiling space above the Holy Ark offered a unique palette for the 1910 mural to be painted. In 1903, Burlington's Jews were still largely a mystery to the resident population. An article from the 1903 Burlington Free Press offers this explanation of the Jewish population. Quote, it is said by Rabbi A. Moskowitz of the Jewish synagogue located on Hyde Street, that's the Chayotam synagogue, that when he first came to Burlington in 1887, there were only about a half a dozen Jewish families in the city. Since that time, he's been acting as the head of the little church, also killing, inspecting, and selling meats in his congregation. The Jewish Sunday begins at sunset on Friday and ends at the same time on Saturday. Services are held in the two synagogues on the evening of Friday and on Saturday forenoon and afternoon. The synagogue of Rabbi Moskowitz has about 40 people in his congregation and that of Rabbi Sachs at the corner of Hyde and Archibald streets has about the same number. And I'm continuing the quote. The people of this nation in this city seldom intermarry outside their own race. And if they do, the ceremony is not performed by the Jewish church. Their homes are for the most part of a very ordinary character, although the race is shrewd in business in a, in a business way and secure not a few of the American dollars." Close quote. As the village grew and evolved, it expanded its gentle village character. By 1910, Burlington's Jewish community had grown significantly to an estimated 800 or so residents. Beyond its numbers, the small community bo boasted a diverse array of essential structures, occupations, and services to sustain their orthodox lifestyle. This included a synagogue, cemetery, ritual bath, kosher butchers, kosher bakery, dairy, grocery, and a minion, which was the prayer group of 10 men. In effect, they transplanted, transplanted their traditional East European village or shtetl model to Vermont. The distinctive character of Little Jerusalem insularity continued during the decades leading up to World War II. UVM sociologist Ellen Anderson in her 1937 pioneering sociological work entitled We Americans, A Study of Cleavage in an American City used Burlington to assess the accuracy of the melting pot theory. While most immigrant groups in Burlington had largely assimilated with one or two generations, a majority of Burlington's Jewish residents continued to eschew social contacts and maintain their traditional insularity. The village became known to its residents as Little Jerusalem. Its story is told in loving detail in Vermont Public Television's award-winning historical documentary. Uh, Aaron and I served as con uh, contributing archivists for this wonderful hour-long film, which you can view online at our lostmural.org website. But let's return to the story of the lost mural. 
1910 was an important year in the life of Little Jerusalem. A third synagogue named Ohavith Gerim, or Lovers of Strangers, was formed by the most recent immigrant arrivals who felt socially inferior within the existing Jewish community. Though the three Orthodox synagogues were effectively in competition with one another, in 1910, they all agreed to build a single Talmud Torah consisting of two floors of Hebrew school classrooms and a social hall on the third floor that, shared, that served the shared needs of the flourishing Jewish community for life cycle celebrations and observance of Jewish holiday gatherings. I'm going to digress for a moment. I realize that we've been using two different pronunciations for the village in Lithuania. So I am trying to use the Lithuanian name, which I believe is Czechishka, and people are welcome to correct me. And Jeff is using the Yiddish name, which is Chaikashuk. In 1910, both the Ohava Zedek and the Chayadam synagogues underwent the renovation and refreshing. At Ohava Zedek, that work included the addition of a new copper work surrounding and covering the wooden ark undertaken by a congregant who was a tinsmith named Morris Wool. Samuel Gruber has opined that the old Ohava Zedek copper ark is also a one of a kind piece. In an effort to refresh their building, Chayadam Synagogue decided to add a mural on the ceiling space above the ark to supplement the painted ark and prayers around the ark and on the building's walls and to paint the entire synagogue ceiling a sky blue with open air effects. We only have this single black and white photo de detailing the artist's work. Above the ark on the right and left sides, the abridged text of the Matovu prayer was painted, meaning how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob. Immediately above the ark and under the painted decalogue is the abridged text of the Kimitzion Tetzay Torah prayer, for out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In 1910, Chayotim's congregation contracted with Ben Zion Black, a 24 year old immigrant from Lithuania to add a mural on the ceiling space above the ark, which houses the Torah scrolls. Black was a professionally trained artist as well as an established theatrical producer from Kovna, a city located 25 miles uh, from Shaikashak. He came to Burlington following his love interest, Rachel Sager, with whom he fell in love in Lithuania after casting her in a play. Notwithstanding the family's apparent dislike of the rakish character, Black and Rachel married in 1912. Tradition says that Black painted the mural in six months directly on the pre-existing plaster walls and ceilings using an oil-based paint. For painting the front ceiling mural, along with traditional prayers on all of the synagogue walls, blue sky and clouds on the building ceiling to create an open air effect, Black was paid the handsome sum of $200 equivalent to just under $5,800 in today's currency. A lifelong resident of Burlington until his death in 1972, Ben Zion Black earned his living as a sign painter, specializing in gold leaf. Many of his commercial designs and logos continue to this very day. Knowing the identity and background of mural painters of Eastern European wooden synagogues is very rare but we know a great deal about the lost murals artist, Ben Zion Black. Interestingly, he was not an active synagogue goer. Rather, his passion in Judaism was largely secular and culturally rooted, and his life was spent in working to preserve Yiddish, the language of the Jewish people. He established both the Jewish Cultural Society and the Yiddish Cultural Society in Burlington. He also regularly sponsored actors from New York City and Montreal to come to Burlington to perform Yiddish music and plays. And he produced Yiddish plays and concerts with local community members while still writing, acting, directing, and singing. He also wrote hundreds of Yiddish poems, some of which we have in our synagogue collection along with his original Yiddish typewriter, a book collector when Black died, his Yiddish library of over 4,000 books was donated by his daughters to a Montreal library. In 1939, High Autumn Synagogue closed and reunited with the Havazetic. 
Subsequently, the building was sold and converted into business space and most notably Harry Wills carpet gallery. Harry Wills stripped the building of everything other than the lost mural, which we only recently learned from his son-in-law, spoke to the observant Catholic wheel. In 1986, when the lost mural building was sold again and plans were made to convert it into an apartment building, George Solomon of Burlington, Vermont alerted me to quote, the disastrous construction plan for the former synagogue building. I arranged with Ben Zion Black's two daughters to then have professional tape pictures taken of the mural in the wheel carpet warehouse for archival purposes. In addition, with the agreement of the owner at the time, the Francis family, and at the suggestion of the Lost Mural Project's coordinating conservator, Richard Kirshner, then with the Shelby Museum, a false wall was constructed in front of the mural to allow, for to allow the future possibility that the mural might survive and later be saved. In 2010, the lost mural arranged the building owners to assess the condition of the lost mural. <clears throat> Tenants had unwittingly, unwittingly been living in front of the false mural from 1986 through 2010. A small hole was cut into the apartment's east wall, east facing wall of the second floor apartment to examine a portion of the hidden mural. Lights were used to determine the lost mural's condition after being hidden for 24 years. What was clear is that the insulation behind the false wall, having been placed too close to the mural surface during the apartment conversion process, had created moisture issues, resulting in some paint having visibly flaked off. Still, the lost mural's rich colors captured in the 1986 archival photos were still visible. Between the, between the time period from 1986, when the mural had been sealed behind a false wall, and when it was then re-examined in 2010, new academic research chronicled the almost total destruction of East European Jewry in Lithuania and of East European wooden painted synagogues and the accompanying artistic genre of Jewish mural and prayer wall painting. Lost Mural Project members have been communicating with many museum and academic experts around the world while unraveling the continuing story of the lost mural. Among these places and people we have been in contact with are the Center for Jewish Art located in Jerusalem, in Israel since 2010, and also during the 2021 complete cleaning and restoration of the lost mural. According to Vladimir Levin, the director of the Center for Jewish Art, it is his opinion that in Lithuania alone, that there were over 700 wooden synagogues. He opines that the majority of them, around 500, were actually wooden painted synagogues. Of this group of 500, Dr. Levin states that there is only one now in Lithuania proper. The other example of Lithuanian, the other Lithuanian example is illustrating the lost genre of these synagogue folk paintings is Burlington, Vermont's lost mural, originally painted in 1910, more than a century ago in this high autumn synagogue by Ben Zion Black, a Lithuanian trained artist for the predominantly Lithuanian Jewish congregants. After consulting with several museum and, several museum and historical experts, the Lost Mural Project was strongly encouraged to make all possible efforts to preserve the lost mural, which they characterized as a surviving remnant of our Jewish artistic and cultural heritage, a unique example of Lithuanian art and cultural heritage and our collective immigrant experience. In 2012, a change in ownership of the original Chayotam building presented the opportunity to rent this apartment space and undertake the full removal of the false wall in order to determine and obtain a complete analysis of the condition of the mural. Damage across the entire mural was clearly visible. Again, the result of insulation having been placed too close to the mural surface. Roughly 10% of the original paint had flaked off and on close examination, much of the remaining paint was no longer completely attached to the plaster. It was actually hanging off of the paint. In 2014, the Lost Mural Project had secured sufficient funds with which to hire Constance Silver, a conservator specializing in art restoration. She began a painstaking, detailed six month project to stabilize the flaking paint on the plaster in anticipation of a future move. As you can see on this slide, Connie Silver had to re-adhere almost 70% of the paint, which had separated, pulled away from the plaster. 
The process involved using a thermosplastic emulsion adhesive on the back side of the paint, together with pieces of mylar to press the paint pieces into the flexible wooden lath slat boards. The adhesive could be activated with heat from a tracking iron, so the paint could be gently flattened and then re-adhered to the plaster. Given the plethora of green and brown drapes, Connie Silver speculated that the mural may have been overpainted at some later date in an effort to cover damage. To assess whether any portion of the original mural had been modified, she reached out to Susan Buck, a paint and finishes conservation analyst from New York. Buck's paint sample test analysis confirmed that multiple layers of varnish with layers of accumulated soot and grime had built up over the years as a result of the coal burning heating system. And these had in fact altered the original colors. However, Susan Buck confirmed that the drapes were in fact part of Black's original design. This image shows the mural and colorful painted surface enveloped in a white webbing before cutting the lost mural from the interior walls takes place and before the framing of the lost mural in its steel case. With Constance Silver's initial cleaning of the lost mural at the Hyde Street location during de December 2014, the results were quite unexpected. The dull green interior drapes reemerged as royal blue. So two purple, pistachio, and crimson red colors were also newly exposed. Needless to say, we were all extremely excited and dancing on the tables with this news. In Exodus chapter 25, verse four, God instructs Moses that before the people left Israel, it left Egypt, the Israelites should accept gifts from the Egyptians. And I'm partially quoting, and these are the gifts that you shall accept from them, gold, silver, and copper, and blue, purple, and crimson yarns, close quote. Blue, purple, and crimson red yarns were the most expensive dyed yarns in the ancient world and served as a mark of royalty. These colors were also directed by God to be used for the tabernacle hangings, coverings for the prayer service utensils, and as coverings for the priestly vestments. At the recommendation of our art experts and conservators, the blue green right side angular wing, which you see here, was separately cut from the wall. We intend to exhibit this piece in a future educational exhibit that will allow visitors to walk around it and see the front paint on the plaster and the structural lath supports behind it. It also has Ben Zionback's Black's signature gold leaf work on the bottom. The missing left side wing did not survive the 1986 conversion of the Chayotam Synagogue building into the apartments. But first we need to address the remarkable feat of actually moving the 22 foot by 11 foot mural in May of 2015. So how do you move a 22 foot by 11 foot mural? The first step taken in October of 2014 consisted of building a large heated three-story temporary shelter around the portion of the building containing the mural. In part, that reflected concerns raised by Rick Kirshner regarding significant variations between the extreme winter outside temperature and the heated indoor apartment temperature, potentially causing cracking during the cold winter months and the possibility of further damage to the mural. By November of 2014, the second floor extension of the temporary building had been constructed and work had begun on a removable roof in, uh, attached with screws. During December of 2014, third floor roof trusses were installed with beams. The temporary structure was completed in January of 2015, with the slate roof of the building's apse then encased within the temporary structure, work could continue through the coldest winter months. Come on. In March of 2015, the entire slate roof was carefully removed. Each slate numbered and the underlying wooden roof at the rear of the lost mural was exposed. April 2015 was a busy month. 
first a renowned conservator, Norman Weiss from Columbia University was brought in to apply a special consolidant to the rear of the mural to strengthen the lath board slats behind the plaster. An extra framing was also installed. In 1986, even before the mural was hidden behind a false wall, architect Marcel Bowden of South Burlington, Vermont, first of South Burlington, Vermont, first conceived that the lost mural could be encased in a frame and lifted it out of its and lifted out of its old home. These plans, drawn by Reliance Steel, are based upon one-of-a-kind engineering specifications of Robert Neld and Oren Gutman of Engineering Ventures Inc. The top plan views the steel frame from the top. Notice the red arrow marking the three-sided steel support portion that provides a strong bond at the top of the mural. The bottom plan shows the rear of the steel frame with its steel bracing rods in the form of the letter X and the top and the side end point locations for additional long support rods, which then extend through the steel frame to be screwed into the iron beams installed in the ceiling. The steel frame was welded in place, yes, with a welding torch, within the temporary structure built on Hyde Street against additional plywood support, which was applied to the rear of the mural to increase the stiffness of the mural plaster on the lath. The steel frame was designed to serve the lost mural in multiple ways during the rescue operation, including its stabilization, lifting and extraction, transporting, depositing the mural in front of its new home, pushing it into the lobby, and finally lifting it to its final destination with its steel frame supporting it. To add needed support while transporting it to its new home, the mural was braced by many layers from the front and back. The actual mural is actually within the wrapped black layer shown here on top of the white air cushion. Now the fun begins as the lengthy plans prepared by the architects, engineers, contractors, steel workers, carpenters, painters, and crane operators begins to unfold. At Ohabi Zedek Synagogue, work was undertaken to install suspended iron beams in the ceiling to hold the mural aloft. To accommodate the size of the steel frame mural, the entire front entryway of the synagogue was removed and a wooden landing pad installed. The entry doors and windows will subsequently be replaced with special UV glass lighting and shades. May 6th, 2015, moving day. Early in the morning, the contractors unscrewed the temporary roof and a 50 ton crane carefully lifted and deposited the roof onto a large roller at street level where it was then pushed away from the building. Remember the temporary portable roof had to be put back on top of the building immediately after the lost mural was removed. Next, crews inside the second floor of the temporary shelter worked with the riggers to connect the crane cables and belts through which uh, the carefully designed fitted holes of the steel mural would then secure the lost, lost mural when it was lifted and moved and still uh, to this day support it. With bated breath, we watched as the 7,500 pound mural within its protective steel frame was lifted out of the building and deposited on a flatbed truck. The red arrows show the extremely thin plaster, less than three quarters of an inch width of the lost mural while it was being lifted, floating in the sky during moving day. Only afterwards did we realize that we had been waiting since 1986 for this moment. To add needed support, the mural was wrapped in layers from the front and back, the actual plaster mural is behind the black wrapped cushion uh, shown here, um, move the head one, shown here on top of, uh, of the white air cushion. Additional supportive layers which are installed in front of the plaster mural include from the surface moving outward, silk, uh, a web material, a waxy layer, uh, the wrapped black cushion, a white air cushion, 
plywood boards, and steel tension rods. Once secured with straps, the mural began its historic, slow, and steady three-tenths of a mile journey to its new home, passing by the original 1885 Ohavi Zedek Synagogue on Burlington's Archibald Street in the process. While the transport truck is moving up the hill, the large crane was moved into position along a temporary sloped gravel road bulldozed adjacent to the synagogue entryway. Once again, the 50 ton crane carefully lifted the mural, this time from the bed of the truck and delivered it onto the landing pad. Then wheels were attached to the pre-drilled uh, pre holes in the steel frame to accommodate the final 50 foot move. With less than an inch of clearance, the mural was manually pushed by the crane riggers across the landing pad and into the synagogue lobby. The following week, the steel and wooden stabilizing floor was removed. Then the now 6,500 pound lost mural was hand pulled by chains and pulleys up to its 11 foot height, its original height in its former home. And it was then attached to the five suspension rods extending from the steel frame into the specially installed I-beam. I wanna take just a moment to also thank two of our other founding members of the 1986 planning team which are Marcel Bowden, the architect that I spoke of, and Richard Kirshner, who is still our coordinating conservator for the Lost Mural Project. Here you see the mural in 1986 on the archival slide and, and in 2014 while it was in the Hyde Street building. So what do the mural symbols mean and what do its colors stand for? The symbolism of the Lost Mural incorporates a number of primary symbols of Judaism. At the center are the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, that sit on the throne of Solomon, which is described in the Book of Kings. The commandments are supported on either side by heraldic rampant lions, familiar in Jewish tradition as the lions of Judah. Above the commandments appears a crown and a ribbon. The two Hebrew words on the ribbon can be translated as Keter Torah, crown of the Torah. The crown of the Torah also reflects the presence of God as further captured in the sun's rays. But the artist had two additional side panels with which to work. And this is where Ben Zion Black added his own unique style and biblical interpretation. One's immediate attention on the side panels focuses on the base of the four vertical columns that draws the eye from the bottom to the top of the mural. The image of the four columns is a reference to the original temple in Jerusalem. Suddenly, as Dr. Samuel Gruber has observed, the theme of the lost mural becomes clear with its newly discovered bright red, blue, and purple curtains, and the four marble columns substituted for the four biblically described acacia tent poles, the lost mural depicts the tent of the tabernacle as described in the Bible. The mobile tent of the tabernacle is the portable sanctuary tent built by the Israelites in accordance with God's specific instructions after they left Egypt. The tabernacle was considered to be the earthly dwelling place of God inside of the sanctuary tent within the camp of the Israelites. That's from Exodus chapter 25, verses eight and nine. The book of Exodus also tells us that the tent of the tabernacle is partitioned into two sections. The first is the outside entry entrance tent called the holy place, which houses an outside altar, tables, and utensils. As depicted by Ben Zion Black here, one walks between the outer courtyard columns seeing the window portals looking outside using a trump loy effect. The book of Numbers, chapter four, verses six through 12, specifies that the outside space be separated from the in inner Holy of Holies area containing, containing the Ark with the 10 commandments by royal blue and purple curtains. In Black's work, you move from the outside tent courtyard wrapped in red curtains through both the royal blue set of curtains and the shimmering purple fabric curtains into this most sacred space called the inner Holy of Holies. While in biblical times, only the high priest was allowed entry into this most sacred space, it appears that black, a recent immigrant, may be suggesting that all people are welcome to enter into the tent of the tabernacles. 
After the 2015 move, initial cleaning continues for a very short time. And the new paint sampling tests reveal even more wonderful and vibrant color clues under the levels of varnish, charcoal, dust, and dirt. Remember this picture from 1986, before the lost mural is hidden away? No one at that time realized that hidden beneath the darkened layers of varnish and grime were vibrant light greens, crimson red tablets with silver lettering for the Ten Commandments, bright yellows, and royal blues and purple curtains all waiting to be revealed. The Lost Murals palette contains a full spectrum of lively and joyful colors, which speak to Benzine Black's artistry, creating a time portal which reopens a centuries old East European tradition of synagogue wall paintings grounded in biblical references and the enduring spirit of immigrant hope. Dr. Joel Elkies, a former resident of Kovno, Lithuania in the 1920s, told us in our visit to Florida that the vibrancy of Black's colors captured the vitality of Jewish life in Lithuania. For centuries, long before World War II and during World War II and up to the Holocaust, Lithuania had been a joyful center of Jewish life, prayer, Talmudic studies, and Jewish arts, including literature, music, paintings, poetry, sculpture, and theater. In 2014, prior to his death, Dr. Elkies reminded us that saving the lost murals color, colors was, quote, tantamount to preserving the magical world of my earliest childhood. By March of 2021, we had successfully raised the required funds and in April commenced the long awaited phase one full cleaning project. Here you see the impressive three-story scaffolding that was constructed to give our two conservators, Constance Silver and Jennifer Baker, direct access to the entire mural. A critical first step that needed to be undertaken both prior to and repeatedly during the cleaning involves sampling paint and sending it to Amy Ives Cole, an historical paint and conservator analysts at Sutherland Consulting in Maine. And you can see all of the little yellow and red dots are samples of paint that were sent to her. As, as you can see from one of her reports uh, where she analyzes paint samples, she finds definitive cross sections revealing layers of material that had accumulated on top of the original paint in glazes used by Denzai and Black. Notice working from the bottom upward, each test sample reveals a base white color. That's the original paint pigmentation. Additional glazes in some cases, and then in all cases, layers of additional varnish embedded with dirt, dust, and grime. It is important to remember prior to the full cleaning, that some, while some portions of the mural reveal vibrant colors exposed through partial cleaning, the mural as a whole remained largely one dimensional in its muted use of color and shadowing. This slide offers a visual representation of the thinness of the plaster layer situated on top of the lath boards. At its thickest, Against the lath board on the right side of this image in the bottom corner, the plaster was probably about three quarters of an inch thick. And at the top, uh, on the right side, probably a half inch. What you can't see in the middle of the mural and along the left side is that the plaster is generally about a 16th of an inch thick or less. Very, very fragile. Located to the right side of the right lion's head, are paint sampled areas indicated with yellow and red dots located within the light pistachio sunray and the light purple curtain. Looking within the inset white rectangle and by reviewing the varnish squares from left to right and top to bottom, one can see the effects of cleaning the darkened varnish with differing amounts of solvent, how it lightens up the pistachio and purple colors with each successive sample. The image on the left shows the, ten, shows the clean Ten Commandments today. The 1986 image on the right shows the darker defined line between the two tablets and the shadowing curvature 
on the bottom of the two tablets, all of which will be restored by glazing the bottom area of the tablets by the next team of conservators who are Williamstown Art Conservation Center members. Here, the roundness of the columns and the shadowing effect of the column bases, the central bay, and along the curtain edges show additional depth achieved by the trompe l'oeil effect utilized by Benzai and Black to achieve the three dimensionality for the areas located inside and outside of the tent of the tabernacles. The left image is a lost mural in April 2021, showing how the varnishes darken the colors. If you compare the same areas within both the left image from April 2021 and the right image from September 2021, you can see the remarkably lightened and, and vivid colors, such as the pistachio green sun rays, the purple curtain, and brown columns with their, with their marbleized white and black paint swirls, all clearly pictured here after the removal of the darkened brown varnish layers and the charcoal dust. By September 2021, the Ten Commandments are red with silver letters, the lions are golden, the jewels within the crown are shimmering, and the throne of Solomon is orange. The base of the throne is now green and is clearly defined with its three-dimensional dimension recessed internal area revealed by the different shades of green and designs and shadows depicted within the throne of Solomon. Also notice the light emerging from the sun even more intensely within the top portion of each sun ray, the white and blue colors bleeding into the pistachio colored rays, rays and the red and orange colors bleeding into the yellow colors, yellow colored rays. The image before you is taken after the phase one cleaning started in April, 2021. And by, two, by June, 2021, when this image was taken, the lost mural was 40% cleaned. This is a fascinating photo. This is a composite image. It was taken on July 15th, 2021. And a composite photo is taken by seaming five photos together, which flattens the mural image. The conservators, are the, the conservators are then able to utilize the image to investigate and determine the visual depth of the paint colors by zooming in with their computer zoom into the area of any color and any area with, it, with their computer. After the phase one cleaning, look how vibrant the colors are now after the darkened varnish layers, the charcoal dust layer and the dirt layers have been removed from the original paint surface. Here you see the final restoration having begun with a clear coat of isolation varnish applied to the surface. All fill work and coloring will be done on top of the clear coat layer. And this restoration is in fact fully reversible. I'm trying to watch my computer. Um, we're looking at the left panel uh, after the clear coat of isolation varnish is applied. Uh, and I think I, I, I skipped, well, let's do that. Here's the center panel. Now this archival slide from 1986 highlights another piece of restoration work to be completed in the phase two full restoration of the lost murals, missing paint and colors, which began in January of 2022. Notice the original green border with decorative curtain balls painted along the right edge of the mural. There was a similar border on the left edge that was lost in the 1986 building renovation. Together, these two external green edges framed the lost mural and defined the outermost tent sides with the green borders. Unfortunately, the remaining right border plaster pieces, which have been saved, are incomplete and far too fragile to install. Here you can see a segment from that green border, which is now being examined and tested uh, by the uh, Williamstown conservators. Its detail will allow these conservators to zoom in on different areas and to compare the multicolored hues and shading within each area 
to try and gauge what is the correct green shade and to, uh, to reproduce uh, this, this border. Continue to learn more about the artistic, cultural, and historical sign significance of Burlington's lost mural. At the end of February 2022, we continued our conversations with the Center for Jewish Art in Israel. Its director, Vladimir Levin, confirmed for us that confirmed for us that 20 to 30 wooden synagogues survive in Eastern Europe in Lithuania. More than 500 of the painted synagogues exi existed in Lithuania before World War II. Of these, according to Dr. Levin, only two painted wooden synagogues may have survived. One is in Ru Romania and one is in Lithuania in a, in a town called Pakrujis and in Yiddish it's Pokroi. And this is a picture of the Pokroi wooden painted synagogue. This was restored in, uh, in 2017, the full restoration was completed. And according to Dr. Levin, it is the only painted wooden synagogue now extant in Lithuania. According to him, that the lost mural in Burlington, Vermont is one of only two, is one of the other remaining samples of Lithuanian murals painted in the style of the interior wall, painted wooden synagogues. Imagine that out of 700 synagogues in Lithuania, 500 of them were, wooden, were painted wooden synagogues. We have one left in Lithuania and there's another one now in Burlington, Vermont. Here's the lost mural as it looked in September of 2021 after the phase one cleaning was completed. Here you see the newly cleaned and radiant mural as it currently appears after the summer's cleaning process, which occurred thankfully on time and within budget. You can see the left and right side wooden roof struts upon which the replicated green side borders will be mounted as our conservators and art experts have strongly recommended in order to properly present the lost mural as originally envisaged and painted by Ben Zion Black. With the phase one cleaning project completed in August, 2021, we're now in the process of the final full restoration of the mural, which we hope will, will occur. Uh, it has begun and we hope will com uh, be completed by the end of April of this uh, year. Uh, we have raised considerable funds. We're continuing to raise funds uh, to cover the cost of this final restoration. Uh, when this work is done, uh, what we will see is the mural as it originally existed in 1910. And rest assured, uh, at that point in time, we would like to invite each and every one of you to come join us uh, and celebrate the completion of this wonderful project. Um, thank you. Uh, for letting us share stories of the Lithuanian painted synagogues in Burlington's Little Jerusalem and the Lost Mural. Uh, and at this point, we'd simply like to uh, uh, turn it over for questions and, uh, and see where you'd like to take us. Thank you so much for, for sharing that incredible story. You know, it, it's just so interesting to, you know, hear a story that has art and religion, but also just really incredibly cool art conservation. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, as we wait for some questions to come in, if anyone has any, please put them in the chat. And I'm just wondering um, what has been the response from the community? You know, have you had um, other people still in the community who remember the mural and um, what does it mean to them? We, we... Aaron and I, when we were young and not white haired or white bearded, spent a good, good amount of time in the early 1980s interviewing a lot of the old time Burlington residents and they had tremendous memories. Um, I, I would say that there are very, very few of them left, but to your notion of community, I think what's astounded us and I hope the point comes across, we characterize this and, and um, we've been very, appreciative to Madeline Cunin um, because she's helped us enormously in the project. And, and, and her argument is that um, this, this piece is really a piece of global import uh, in that it acknowledges uh, an important uh, piece of immigrant history and immigrant history in Vermont that 
celebrates, you know, uh, a, a tremendous sense of, of, of hope and, 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 and all. Our thought is that this, is, this belongs to all of us in Vermont. It's, it's really a part of our history, part of our immigrant history about which we sometimes have, have not done a particularly good, good job of writing about. He, he says, as he spent his life writing about Vermont history, um, but, but the, the hope is as we move forward that this is a piece of memory that we've captured. Our hope is to build uh, educational exhibits and to invite everybody in. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of questions here about when the mural restoration will be completed and um, will be restore a paint to make it a complete mural? Yes, uh, we, the paint testing samples that we have taken have all been analyzed by the paint analysts that we've told you about. And the Williamstown Art Conservation uh, conservators uh, have established what the original palette was of benzine black. So during this month of March, they are they started at the end of January and they started uh, with some the, putting the clear coat on the entire mural so that whatever you then apply can be reversed if it's needed to be reversed, if there's another if, if something is suggested that uh, some part of the restoration needs to be redone or if, for maintenance or repair purposes. Uh, but in any event, all of the original colors will be restored. They're now in the process of filling. So they fill all of the blank spaces, which are about 10 to 12% with, an air, with a material that kind of looks pink when it goes on and it turns to white. And we will have some slides of that, of that for the next presentation. Uh, and then they will actually start blocking the colors this month they will come, they will finish the blocking uh, as planned by the end of March, and they will be then coming back for probably two or three trips in April to do the to finish the actual coloring. And, and which is pretty neat because no one that we know of who is alive now remembers what the original colors were in 2000, in 1910. Mm -hmm. As Jeff said, there are people who still are alive who are in their 90s who do remember being before the mural. In fact, if anyone here uh, uh, knows of people who may have been brought up in Burlington or may have visited Burlington, we would love to hear their memories of anything relating to the lost mural. We did visit with a gentleman, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Arthur Cunin, who was telling us that he was then coming to, New York, coming to Burlington during his summers, uh, and his grandfather took him to the Chi Autumn Synagogue, which then had the mural in it in the warehouse, and he was terrified of the lions. They just scared oh. him. <laughs> That's a great story. Um, Christine asks how the public, especially those not in Burlington, will know when they can visit. Uh, so we, we, yeah, go, uh, uh, well, here, I'll grab this one, Aaron. It's an easy one. So we have um, a website, thelostmural.org, and we keep it updated. And uh, basically, we're going to inform, rest assured, everyone uh, when it opens, uh, reopens to the public. And um, as I say, it's, it's, it's open during... Uh, regular business hours, Monday through Friday. And, um, you know, we'd love to see you. We'll also That's be great. posting times when we, uh, when we probably in the spring or summer, we'll, we'll actually be doing some public tours uh, on different weekends also for members of the public to come in. It is quite different in person than- I imagine in, so. Because <laughs> it, it's just so massive. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite striking. I actually have one more question. I think I think the questions are slowing down, but one other one I had was, um, is there, did Black do any work with theater curtains? You know, when I think about the theater curtain project in Vermont, there's so many similarities to the artistic style and yet it has the Lithuanian tradition. So can you talk about that at all? Or there, thoughts there's, about that? There's, there's no question, um, you know, his love of theater um, and his experience with theater clearly influenced the way in which he set this thing up, uh, you know, without a doubt. Um, and when he came to Vermont, it was very, very interesting uh, because in 1910, they gave him the job. He, he uh, uh, eventually married, um, uh, you know, he found, found uh, uh, his, his wife and he decided that Burlington was a small place and not a particularly exciting place. And so he convinced her to go to Boston where he worked in theater. And I suspect did a lot of theatrical curtain work and the like. Um, in the end, she was homesick and she insisted that he return, that they return to Burlington. Um, we know of that, we do not know of anything he did uh, theatrically and Aaron can correct me. We know that he painted 
uh, we know that he did many paintings. His, his, uh, they're, they're paintings of musical instruments that we know that his family has. There are um, various paintings here or there, but there's no evidence that, that um, you know, he either you know, went into uh, intensely theatrical work, nor did he ever make another religious mural. Hmm. His wife's name was Ruth Sager Black, and uh, both members of the Black family and members of the Sager family have provided us with, with photographs or slides of artwork that he did, and they are on our website. Uh, the, there, there are stills with, with fruits, uh, there are landscapes, there are ocean pictures with boats, uh, but we're, we don't know of any other and the family doesn't know of any other pieces that were done with theatrical curtains, but I, we're assuming he did because he was very, very talented. He also worked on the state house. He did some of the of the gold leaf on the state house roof at some point. Uh, and here, Aaron Cohen says, I believe he organized a mandolin orchestra. Yes, yes. he did. Yes, he did. In fact, uh, we, we're, we're, our belief is that uh, there were several dozen of the students or of the youth group who were all given mandolins and he then taught them all to play mandolin. His <laughs> mandolin, there's a slide in the 1986 uh, archival slides, you'll see where he had a mandolin painted that was on the left side of the arc towards the floor. And we were always wondering about that mandolin. We discovered that his grandson, who is in the state of Washington, actually has his grandfather's mandolin. And he provided us with photos of the mandolin, which are also online. And it, it's pretty cool to look at the photos of the mandolin against the, the original. Um, it's quite fascinating. You shared the incredible detailed work the conservators did and bravo to Rick Kirshner for holding it all together and managing to fly that through Burlington without the plaster cracking. But Barry wonders if you had any unexpected difficulties along the way. I would say we had an incredible team. Um, and what was remarkable, and I and the you know, I mean the amount of the, the the awards that each and every one of them has 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 received is, you know, we're 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 justly, you know, we're we're fully justified uh, because we challenged each and every one of them to do something that none of them had ever done before. Um and um there wasn't anything unexpected. Aaron and I laugh about the fact that after the mural had been deposited in the synagogue, we happened to walk around the back of it. And we discovered that there was a nail, which no one had picked up on, which, which had been just set along the back. Um, on a roof rafter. And, and it was it's just, there. <laughs> it, it was still there. It hadn't moved. It wasn't, it wasn't hammered in. It was just stuck on, it was just sticking <laughs> with some dust or dirt. <laughs> and you know that that the mural was moved seven times before it got to its final place in the synagogue. That's a lot of movement. Uh, but the engineers and the contractors and the riggers and the steel folks, they did an extraordinary job of of figuring out what the tolerance could be. I think it was, it's, I think it's either 0. 0.00001 or 0. 0.0001 of an inch that it could move in any in any way because if it. If it had, if it had uh, fractured at any point on any side, the entire side would have gone, hmm. and 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 it would have been it would have been horrible. Um, and in fact, they, I mean, their planning was so meticulous; they had estimated it was going to take twelve hours to move the mural on the day of the move. You can see there's a, there are videos of the move. In fact, there's a twelve minute time lapse. It's very very interesting. It's not there's no sound to it, but it's very cool to watch. It's the whole project in five five years and twelve minutes. Um, but uh, it shows that they did it in four hours. We, we were, I mean, there were people who came to see the mural being moved and they got there after it was done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a it's an incredible story of, um, of um, culture and religion and the saving of culture and, you know, kudos to the, you know, the people um, who came to Burlington at the turn of the century and brought their traditions with them and retained them and valued them so, so much. And kudos to you for recognizing that and um, realizing that you had something that the world needed to have saved. So I just want to thank you both so much for a great evening tonight. And um, I'm sure everybody here also agrees that um, 
this is a really uh, special presentation um, uh, that we all need to hear today in these days. So thank you. Thank we you also all. just want to take a moment to thank all of the contractors and engineers and steel folks and movers and and just extraordinary people who worked on the project as contracting folks and all of our donors, individual and foundations who had the foresight to understand how important this piece of art is to our immigrant history and the state of Vermont's history and international history at this point. So thank you so much for allowing us to present to you.